Looks like Chef Ramsay is having a fantastic time between filming the next season of Kitchen Nightmares and attending concerts. While he's determined to help everyone who seeks his help, let's quickly go over the current status of those restaurants who are lucky enough to receive his valuable guidance. And what a better way to start this list with this restaurant where one of the customers broke down into tears over a disappointing lunch service. Would you like something else? You ran out of the fries, you ran out of the bun, this is bad. I mean, how bad could it be for a full-grown woman to cry her eyes out because the restaurant served her a sad excuse for food? The thing is, this customer was looking forward to savoring some great burgers, but the restaurant decided to replace the buns with sourdough sandwiches. Ouch. What makes it worse is that they didn't even inform her about the switch. The servers then brought the so-called burgers over to the table, and the customer's reactions were quite legit. If your bun? That is all we have is a bun. And well, that's what went down at Jay Willie's in South Bend, Indiana. The restaurant was owned by John Williams, Rick, and Trisha, and just like you saw, they didn't give a damn about customer service. Now, Chef Ramsay can't turn water into wine, but he can turn failing restaurants into successful ones. And well, that's nothing short of a miracle. Like this time, when Ramsay took over the confessional box at a church. Most people who face the pressure and the problems I have give up. I'll fight till the last dog dies. Being a psychologist is one thing, but this little action from Chef Ramsay led to several different opinions. Some even found this move to be a little blasphemous and odd. What did you think? Personally, I don't mind. It was an emotionally impactful scene and cathartic for the owners. Chef Ramsay even bestowed the restaurant with a new name, and they were now called the Jay Willie's Barbecue House. But here's the sad truth, Jay Willie's Barbecue closed its doors on February 4th of 2009. Sure, the added publicity and positive vibes initially brought in some customers. They even won a competition for their signature barbecue sauce. But the service quality was very hit or miss according to a few Yelp reviewers. Talk about a short-lived success. The restaurant couldn't even keep its doors open for a year after the episode aired. A local on Reddit, who ate there before Chef Ramsay's visit, confirmed that the food was crappy and the service was very slow. And although they never revisited the place after the revamp, he says that the word on the street was that it was a shiny new dining area with the same old BS food and wait times. Ouch, it seems like they went back to their old ways. But I think you have to consider the economic slump in 2008. The owners desperately sought an investor to save them from the depths of debt, but as you guessed it, they couldn't get lucky. And since no fairy godmother came to their rescue, barely a year after the economic crunch in 2009, Jay Willies finally said its final goodbyes. While this restaurant made their customer cry, this next one gave the internet one of the most hilarious zingers. Hey, Panini head, are you listening to me? Yes. You're gonna kill someone. And no matter how many times I watch this, it still gets me. Meet Chris Posner and Brian Kelly, the dynamic duo behind Hannah and Mason's. But turns out, things didn't go as planned. Looking back, no, I don't think I would go into business with Brian. This was a mistake. Now, here's where the fun really begins. Brian, the mastermind behind this brilliant plan, wanted the restaurant to be only open three nights a week. Because, well, he wasn't a fan of working nights. Now, this was his mantra. I'm very laid back. I don't think I let a lot of things bother me. So when Chef Ramsay was there to observe the dinner service on Valentine's Day, love wasn't exactly in the air. I had a nice, nice. I guess I couldn't afford the end. That's not a good start. Instead, he found himself immersed in the stench of raw chicken and desserts that were at least a week old. The dishes were far away from being love at first bite. Well, you can see it for yourselves. It tastes like I've just had the dregs from the dishwasher. Eventually, thanks to Ramsay's interception, like every other restaurant featured on the show, Hannah and Mason's received a snazzy menu and makeover. They went for a country cafe look, embracing a casual fare with a local twist. But guess what? According to Chris, his loyal customers absolutely despise the changes. He swiftly reverted back to the old menu and decor months before the episode even aired. The owner hoped that TV exposure would attract new business, but instead, he received phone calls from fans scolding him for not taking Ramsey's advice. Ugh, not the kind of response he was expecting, but dude, they weren't wrong. Sadly, this place was shut down in February of 2010. However, locals wished that the restaurant stayed open so that they could eat their favorite turkey panini. It must have been good if they really missed it that much. 
As for the owners, Chris eventually closed Hannah and Mason's after blaming the nosediving economy and the loss of their corporate catering business. By the way, it made up half of their revenue. According to him, the show had little to no effect on the decision. In fact, Chris shared that with or without the show, I think we would have closed down. So, it seems like Hannah and Mason's was destined for a bad ending from the get-go. Surprisingly, Chef Ramsay shared the same feelings as well. In a statement to the New York Post, he simply stated, Unfortunately, they were going to close anyway before I even got there. According to a reporter at Nation's Restaurant News, before Chris dropped off the keys to his recently closed restaurant, he put on a hat and sunglasses. You see, he really didn't want to be recognized as he went to the building that housed his former business. In his own words, Chris admitted to feeling embarrassed about the whole situation. The lack of increased traffic and months of declining sales finally made him listen to the advice of his accountant and lawyer. It was time to take action and put a stop to this downward spiral. His wife started working full time and Chris stepped up to take care of their three younger children. Maybe there was an upside to this after all, because according to him, his kids were very excited to finally spend more time with him. Well, I think that's what he always wanted for himself. Being ridiculously cautious and fearful. He played safe. Yes, sir. But here's a juicy little tidbit. Chris shared that when he first auditioned for Kitchen Nightmares, he actually got rejected because the restaurant was doing too well. Could you believe that? Talk about a twist of fate. Eventually, they made their way onto the show, and that's when things took an unexpected turn. Chris confessed that he and his team felt a bit dirty afterwards. The producers bombarded them with questions, and in the excitement of it all, they felt like they turned on each other and felt violated once the episode aired. I'm saying you're right. Relax, guys. You're right. And oh, he seems to be doing great now. According to his LinkedIn profile, he has worked at Mitsui Foods as the Director of Culinary Innovation. Chris now seems to be the VP of Culinary Innovation at a food company in New York called Season Cart. This guy means business, and he's not afraid to show it. According to his LinkedIn bio, he's got an old-school work ethic that's as solid as a perfectly seared steak. He's dedicated to every business venture as if it were his own. Now, that's what I call passion. As for Billy, he's working as the sous chef at Jume Raw Creekside Hotel, which is also great news. Well, these owners are a clear example of how you can pivot and evolve. Now, this next restaurant rocked Miami, and trust me when I tell you that the drama was crazy with a capital C. So apparently, a Miami Herald TV writer, Glenn Garvin, decided to go undercover and dine at Fleming during the filming of this episode. Okay, so here's where things get really interesting. Garvin's report paints quite the picture, and it's not a pretty one. He claims that the show is fake and that he was threatened to have his notebook confiscated. But hold on, don't jump to any conclusions yet. According to Garvin, the producers of the show allegedly instructed customers to complain loudly and bitterly about the food or service. Apparently, if you have something to say about the food or service, a producer instructs you to give them a signal so they can bring the camera to your table. Once there, the customers aren't supposed to look directly at the camera, but instead, speak in a loud voice so the microphone could pick them up clearly. Uh, wait, so what about that is staged? Isn't that how reality TV works? What do you think? Personally, I think calling the show fake is an exaggeration. If you remember, this restaurant was having a serious identity crisis and was stuck in the past. So here's the issue with this place. Fleming was a Danish restaurant in sunny South Florida with a Cuban head chef. I mean, you see the problem here, right? Naturally, the food wasn't great. I mean, Caesar salad with carrots? Complicated. My grand could do better. This is dead. No thank you. But it wasn't entirely Orlando's fault. In fact, he was very passionate and keen to learn from the famous chef. Andy and Suzanne Hall, the owners, weren't even Danish, and one of the two, Andy, wasn't really flexible to any change. Just been afraid to change. You're nostalgic with something that's not worked for a long time. Trust me, when he said that this was one of the most extensive Kitchen Nightmare overhauls yet, Chef Ramsay wasn't kidding. Because you know what happened? They literally changed everything. The menu, the decor, the kitchen, and even the marketing. Nothing was spared. It's safe to say that Fleming got a contemporary facelift, bidding Edzure to those pastel colors straight out of an 80s sitcom. But wait, there's more. Chef Ramsay even went the extra mile and organized a swimsuit fashion show on the vibrant streets of Miami to generate buzz for the restaurant. Talk about making a splash. He really set them up for success, but they couldn't keep up. 
At first, they seemed to be on the right track, embracing Ramsey's changes and riding the wave of improvement. However, it didn't take long for the restaurant to slide back into their old habits. They started sneaking in those beloved pre-Gordon dishes in an attempt to please their regulars. Dessert bar? Check. Soup and salad with every single meal? You got it. It's like they just couldn't resist the pull of the past. Fast forward to October of 2010, and Fleming's fate was sealed. As of 2023, Fleming remains a distant memory. And how's Andy doing? Word is that he's working as the director of operations at Chartwells' University of Miami. Well, that's the end of his food business era. But there are some restaurants who have stood the test of time, pressure, and of course, the overbearing pandemic. I'd like to now bring up Spin a Yarn, which has managed to knit a loyal following of satisfied customers in California. Owner Saki Cavognatis and his wife Jennifer are still killing it with their lip smacking food. I can't believe why Oprah is sitting in my living room. Yeah, that's the same Jennifer we're talking about. If you remember, on the show, she made certain remarks that led to the internet calling her a trophy wife. He's not someone I would typically go for, or physical appearances. She only realized that she loved him when this happened. We went to Hawaii, we went to shows, we went to concerts, and then I realized I loved him. Needless to say, this didn't go down well with the viewers, who went to the extent of labeling her as a gold digger. Anyway, it was still disheartening to hear that things actually fell apart. Kind of divorced, but we okay. still have very close to this. Yeah, the couple are no longer married, but they're still friendly. And well, Jennifer is still involved in running the restaurant. Plus, it looks like their daughter and granddaughters loved joining them at work as well. And by the way, she's still listed as the social media manager at Spin a Yarn Steakhouse on her LinkedIn. Also, when she's not helping at the restaurant, she's busy voicing her strong opinions on Instagram. Now, here's something else I found out about her. She was running for Area 3 seat on the FUSD Board of Education, but her socially conservative views made her extremely unlikable. But the list doesn't end there. Jennifer is currently also the Gold Ambassador of Plexus Worldwide, a wellness and fitness center in Scottsdale. Anyway, I don't think Saki needs her physically at the restaurant anymore because he's doing just fine and has helped earn the restaurant a stunning 4.4 stars on Google. Similarly, Zena Flaming Grill in Redondo Beach is also a true survivor. It defied the odds and kept its flames burning bright since Chef Ramsay paid a visit over a decade ago. It's a restaurant that has mastered the art of resilience, proving that not all kitchen nightmares end in closure. While the ownership torch has been passed to Ray Yunis, who is the new captain steering the ship, Zena's Flaming Grill remains a cherished family establishment. They've embraced the digital age, dishing out social media posts on Facebook and Twitter, earning a mouthwatering 4.8 star rating along the way. They're even giving a nod to their time in the spotlight, proudly sharing links to the show and Chef Ramsay. They're also expanding with branches in Redondo Beach and Los Angeles. But this next restaurant was probably the most famous to ever be featured on the show. Well, it was a Michelin star restaurant, which definitely makes it stand out. Yeah, I'm talking about the Walnut Tree Inn. The restaurant was owned by the renowned Italian chef Franco Taruccio for over 30 years. He was considered one of the early celebrity chefs. But then, Francesco Mattioli came into the picture. He bought the restaurant from Toruccio and took on the challenge of running it himself. The problem, as you might remember, was that Francesco wasn't a cook. And that created some issues in the kitchen. One month after his initial visit and makeover, including bringing him Chef Spencer Ralph to take on the role of head chef, Chef Ramsay found that things were improving. Francesco was keeping his distance from the kitchen, which was a really positive change. However, there was some bad news. The restaurant had lost its Michelin star by that time. But don't worry, there's a little spoiler coming up. They, however, managed to regain their Michelin star later on in 2010. During Chef Ramsay's second visit, he noticed that the business was once again declining. The one reason for this was that people found the prices to be way too high. He tried to show Francesco that they could adjust the recipes and lower the prices without compromising on quality. But Francesco was resistant to the idea and didn't want to make any changes. Okay? The Walnut Tree is still open and serving to this very day. This makes it the oldest restaurant from Kitchen Nightmares to still be in operation, which is quite impressive to say the least. It did have a brief closure in early 2007, but Chef Sean Hill stepped in and reopened the restaurant later on that same year. Since then, things have been going really well for them. 
Interestingly enough, after their second appearance on Kitchen Nightmares in 2005, the Mattiolis, Francesco, and his wife criticized the show as fake. They blamed it for making their restaurant seem too expensive and ultimately leading to its closure in 2007. Miss Mattioli said that it was a mistake and that the show put people off due to the perception of high prices. No, I don't want to go down on, on, on the cheap side. But this next one is one of my favorites. It's Miss Jean's Southern Cuisine, and let me tell you, it had quite the successful run. However, they did have to make a move from its original Wilkinsburg location. The reason behind the move was that the building where the restaurant was located got sold. So they had to find a new place to set up shop. But don't worry, the new location was just a few blocks down the street in Hosanna House. Sadly, after a remarkable streak of success, Miss Jean's Southern Cuisine closed its doors in October of 2022. It's quite impressive that the restaurant managed to stay open for almost exactly a decade after the episode aired on TV. And well, that's definitely something worth acknowledging. However, while the restaurant itself may no longer be in operation, that doesn't mean Miss Jean has hung up her apron for good. She's now offering catering services. Miss Jean even received an award from the mayor for her years of community service. She generously provided free food for those in need, which truly made a difference. In fact, June 3rd was officially declared Miss Jean's Day in honor of her contributions, though I'm not entirely sure if the town is still celebrating it. Nonetheless, it's heartwarming to know that Miss Jean's efforts were recognized and appreciated. So these were some of the most memorable mentions that I could think of, and I can't wait for the new season to get started. Do you think the show is staged in any way? Are you a diehard fan like myself? Well, you can now share your thoughts and discuss all of this and more on my Discord server for free. And guess what? I even have an exclusive server for those of you who are interested. But before you leave, make sure to smash that like button, subscribe, and turn on my post notifications. Also, don't forget to check out my latest video right here, it's even crazier.